Welcome to Speak From The Body, a podcast that seeks to explore the wealth of wisdom of the body. My name is Avni Trivedi, and I'm your host, as well as an osteopath, doula and movement teacher. In this podcast, I speak to experts about all sorts of topics to do with the body, such as touch, trauma, body confidence, gratitude, birth, movement, relaxation and baby development. My wish is that you learn how to connect with, listen to and respect your body. Today's episode is with Anna Lovind. Anna helps feminist creatives and change makers go from dreaming to doing without the striving and overwhelm. She's the author of The Creative Doer and she hosts a beautiful online course and community where women from all over the world gather to make good stuff happen. Anna lives with her two daughters, two cats and a dog in rural Sweden, where forests are deep, winter is dark and summer nights last forever. I'd like to welcome Anna to the podcast. Hi, Anna. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to go straight in by asking, because I find myself quoting you quite a lot and Mm -hmm. saying about creating from overflow. And it relates so much to whether I'm working with a client who's sleep deprived or someone who's starting a new business or it's it's such a it's such a good phrase. And I'd love to talk more of what that actually means. Yeah. Yeah, that is one of the core principles of my teachings actually and i think it is one of the core principles of a sustainable life because how we live often is definitely not creating from the overflow but rather using up all the resources that we need to sustain ourselves because we have too much to do or because we are so entangled in this culture of busyness and striving and achieving and so on. So we exhaust ourselves, we deplete ourselves because we don't know how to fill our cup, so to speak. Maybe we're not even aware that it is a possibility to actually fill ourselves up to the point that we actually overflow and that we can use that overflow to create from, to act from, to live from, rather than constantly, you know, being stuck in these cycles of, of, you know, where we we have a bit of energy and then (laughs) we get to work and then we overwork or overextend ourselves and then we get depleted and then we have to sort of step back or pull back or we become sick and that takes care of itself, so to speak. And then when we have a bit of energy again, we get right back into that cycle. And that's that's the cycle that I'm looking to break in my work, where I'm looking to sort of organize our lives in such a way that we don't come to that point of depletion. You know, that we we rather learn to consistently fill ourselves up, tend to our needs, our basic needs, our human needs in such a way that we don't get depleted and then you know we have that constant more or less constant because it wavers over the year and 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 with our own cycles but more or less constant flow in ourselves in our lives and that is the flow that we create from and when i say create i don't just mean create as an artist in, in the traditional sense that we do crafts or arts or anything like that but whatever we create in our lives whether that be children or our work or whatever we bring from idea into reality that's creating that's the way i use the word and when we can get to that point you know then then we have i think that is perhaps the definition of a sustainable life that we don't deplete our resources, we always know how to fill ourselves up and then we can create from the overflow that we create within ourselves and in our lives. And that is is what I'm teaching and what I'm 
sort of <laughs> learning to do myself because that's certainly not something I was taught. And so it's been a long process of unlearning and relearning and just restructuring my life in such a way that this way of living is possible. Nothing in our culture and our society supports that, really. So it's a big shift. And if someone's listening and has been pushing too fast and for too long and is really depleted, what yeah. are some ways of filling the cup when, I mean, it, it can feel so remote, can't it, to be creating a life on your terms? Yeah. So how, how would you even start if you're just not in that place right now? Yeah, most of us aren't, I think. and. Uh, the usual advice that you get when you flip through a magazine or whatever is the surface level stuff, you know, that, that can absolutely feel good, but doesn't really address the issue. You know, the bubble bath, uh, the massage or, or, you know, those simple quick fixes that might get you through another week or another month, but it doesn't really address what got you there in the first place. You know, what, what, brought you to this place of near exhaustion or complete exhaustion. Uh, so when I'm talking about self-care and tending to our needs and so on, I, I talk about those basic things, which are much more difficult to address, of course, because they're bigger issues. They're, they're the kind of issues that uh, go deep in your life and when you change them you sort of have to uproot and, and rearrange a whole lot of things and that can cause <laughs> that can cause all sorts of discomfort and, and challenges in your life but it's about first of all making sure that your basic human needs are met for most of us that's not even true we don't get enough sleep you know, we don't know or have access to uh, proper nutritious food and so on. We don't get enough downtime compared to the time that we're on or that we're working and that we're producing and that we're busy. So like the balance is off. So that's that's always where I start looking at what is your life. What is the balance off in your life right now? And how can we start to shift that? And sometimes, like I said, these are big shifts. These are big issues to look at. And that can be daunting. It can be difficult because sometimes that has to do with the way your job is organized. Maybe you're expected to be at the office 12 hours a day or something like that. And that in itself is not sustainable. And it's not easy to fix. It is where you're income comes from and like that's your career but still just identifying the fact that okay here's an area where to begin to at least contemplate what changes can i start working towards or what changes can i make right now sleep for instance instance is one such thing that we usually can get to work on right away or you know create better circumstances for for good sleep and is there do i have enough support in my life that could be around caretaking which is the case for so many women we're caretakers when it comes to children and when it comes to elderly parents and you know at work we're usually expected to be the caretakers as well unspoken usually, but still the expectation is there that we take care of relationships, we take care of the environment and so on. All those different things. Where can I start giving less in certain areas where it isn't necessary for me to give actually? I mean, if you have kids, obviously that's your responsibility. You're going you're gonna to need to tend to them. But where where is it not necessary for me to constantly be giving, to constantly be at service and, and be available for everything and everyone? And and like those boundaries, that's another huge issue beyond 
the very basic needs such as sleep and food and rest and recuperation and all that but the boundaries where are they sort of being too flexible where aren't they present at all for for a lot of women there are no boundaries in place so to have a look at that where are the draining relationships in my life where am i giving in a way that isn't proportionate to what i'm getting or what i'm receiving where am i sort of being taken advantage of and all those big big issues that's where the change is and and honestly i'm not sure we can do create these big shifts on our own that's why i'm always going on about support that we need to be properly supported in our lives because uh, yes we live in this culture where where we you know the religion of busy is is i mean it's almost everywhere but we also live in a culture where we're supposed to manage way too much on our own the focus on the individual is crushing for many people and these are the kinds of shifts the big ones that i'm talking about that i don't think we can or at least i think it's a lot more difficult to do to manage on our own so we need to find some kind of support system for practical matters for sure but but also for this process of change that you have people in your life who understand what you're trying to do and who support that change because not everyone in your life will so just finding a couple of friends or you know someone in your life that is willing and able to support you in this and maybe look at it together and talk about these things that will make a huge difference so that's i mean that's definitely a place to start to to look for that support to look for that space or place where where you can start addressing these issues and and feel supported in the process and one of the big things that i've learned from being in your community is just what happens when people share their truth and that when we that, you know there's a weekly co-working session and when people say oh in this session i'm a bit tired so i might just take it easy and have a cup of tea or i might dance or it's not like the thing of actually finding the right community that reflects your needs, I think is so important. It's not just about taking off more things on a to-do list or just about celebrating wins, but actually really hearing where people are at that day. I think that's so important. Yeah, because it's easy to find a space uh, or find people who will celebrate your wins with you. It's a lot more difficult to find people who will understand and support you when you're looking to do less and looking to slow down and looking to question the way we are taught to do things do life in in this world that we're living in right now so definitely finding the right community and the right support the right people and sometimes that is a paid practitioner someone you seek out like you for instance i mean someone who people come to when they need support with a certain issue or sometimes that's a community such as the one that i host that you're part of and sometimes it's a good friend or or just someone on the same journey i think but whatever it is i think it's necessary i think we can't do this alone you mentioned about doing less but ironically when someone's actually focused on the things that really matter to them then there's abundance isn't there eventually it's not about it's doing less of the things that don't matter to you right that's the thing you know because when you uh, a yes to something is always a no to something else and, and the other way around and when you keep saying yes to everything 
that inevitably means you're saying no to those few things that really, really, really matter. You get less time for that, less energy for that. And when you start exercising that no a bit more, putting up those boundaries, prioritizing harder, then they will begin to, to be a bit space in your life to focus on those few things that really make a difference that really matters and when that when when you start to rearrange your life like that there is an abundance you notice that there actually is time available it just it's it's just that you know it won't just drop into your lap you're going to have to sort of create the right circumstances for it and that that means saying no usually that means removing things from your plate just like i was saying before like are you really responsible for all these things that you're doing is there something that you can stop doing or delegate or whatever so that you can create a little bit more of that space and when you do there is you know there is breathing room and there is space for you to explore what is your actual pace if you remove yourself from that hamster wheel of busyness what is a good sustainable pace for you to work in there is space to create in a new way in a different way that isn't necessarily about productivity but about the process about having a good process which in a way, it translates into a good life. Because whatever we do and how we do it, that is our life, right? Um, to get away from that focus on, on the goal line, on the horizon over there, where we're going to rest and we're going to be happy and everything. We know by now that, that that's not going to happen. We never get there. It's how we do it right now. It's the space we create right now, the time we prioritize right now, our health and so on. That's our life. My experience is, I mean, it's, that's not why I teach what I teach, but my experience is that when we slow down, when we focus, things move smoother. It's, it's a much smoother journey. And smoother often translates to faster in the end. We get to where we want and need to go faster and with a lot less effort in the end, in the long run. So it's, <laughs> I think we got it so backwards. I think this rushing, rushing, rushing and pushing and striving, that's what keeps us stuck often. How can you differentiate between what's resistance if you're, say, working on a creative project? Like I found that a lot when I'm trying to write because... I've put writing on such a pedestal compared mm. to actually really tuning into what's my pace or what's this sustainable for me. Right. Yeah, that's something I think comes with experience. I think intuition is a language that we learn to speak or rather we learn to listen to because it's always there and we're not encouraged to hear it or pay attention to it normally. So when we start trying to do that, uh, we're a bit rusty. We don't always pick up on the signals. And when we do, at first, we're just conditioned to overrun what we hear. If what we hear is somehow <laughs> counter to being going fast and being productive and, and doing it the usual way, so on. So in the beginning, it's it's you won't always know what is resistance and what is your body wisdom telling you to rest, for instance. Are you just procrastinating or are you actually tending to a need that will make it possible for you to work? So I think it's a bit of trial and error in the beginning. But if you commit to actually learning to listen to your body, to listen to your intuition, to, uh, to co-create in that way. 
you will eventually know the difference because it is there. And to me at this point, it's very clear. I know exactly what procrastination feels like. And I also know what it feels like when I'm, when I need to rest or when I need to move or when like my mind is overloaded and I need to just do something that clears it again so that I'm able to write without all that resistance. All the, like these are completely different things, but in when, when we don't know how to communicate with ourselves on a deeper level, it all sounds the same. It all becomes the same. But one thing to look for when it comes to resistance and procrastination and so on is that there's always fear beneath, always fear. If you sort of sit with that feeling and, and, and not just argue with it or try to push through it, but if you actually take a moment to sit with it, maybe journal from it, not about it, but sort of give that resistance a voice. Let, let it have your pen for a moment and just write from there. You'll find fear beneath it. You'll find the fear of not being good enough. What you're going to write is, is never going to be good enough, so why even bother? Or if you write that thing, people are going to have opinions, so just better to stay safe and not write anything, and so on. You'll find fear beneath it. Whereas if the call to rest is there and it's about tending to your actual needs, that's not fearful. That's, you know, when you, when you listen to it, there's that sense of relaxation in there, like, oh, like a deep breath. And you will feel stronger and, and more energized and more available to your work when you've tended to it. Whereas it, when, you, when you give in, so to speak, to whatever resistance you're facing, that will only increase the stress. So it's, it's, it's something to learn, something to practice. But I find that fairly quickly you learn to differentiate between these different impulses. And once you do, you'll know how to meet them also. And when you you talked about fear just now, and I've I've used something that you've talked about about just finding the next step and making that step smaller rather than it being things like the tax return and the tax return feels really scary compared to just doing my expenses for the month of January or something like that and breaking yeah. it down. That's made such a palpable difference of you know because I'm in my work I'm so much about the nervous system and what it feels and what it needs mm. so to actually be able to work creatively in that way has really made an impact yeah that's that's game changing for most people when when you're not familiar with the creative process and the way that you respond to it um the way fear works in you in your life and 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 the way we cycle through the creative process in very similar ways uh, regardless of what it is that we're creating and regardless of if it's the first time or the hundredth time we cycle through different phases of, of creativity and the difference between the first and the hundredth is that you, by then you know this so you won't get stuck in it but the first time you don't know these faces and we often we often step into it like and our goal is more or less the same as our to-do list like write a book <laughs> <laughs> you put that on your to-do list <laughs> and then you sit down and it's like oh my god it's like the gap is huge between where you are right now and where you want to go with that finished book you know but if instead you begin to break it up into little little tiny pieces where on today's to-do list you say sit down and write for 20 minutes or sit down to doodle a bit about the outline for this chapter one for instance then that becomes doable. 
that is something you can actually sit down and do. It's, it doesn't feel like climbing a mountain. It's just, okay, 20 minutes, yeah, I can do that with permission to do it crappily and so on. But when you sit down to write a book, <laughs> you actually rarely even get to the point where you sit down because there will be so much resistance uh, because this, that step is too big, so you won't ever get to you won't ever get to your desk in the first place. So that is absolutely necessary for you to be able to show up for your work, to break it down into small pieces and plan accordingly. Like you don't plan to write a book; you plan to write a draft of the first chapter, or you know that kind of thing that kind of doable thing and and to then let that inform your planning no actually it's not it's not reasonable to expect yourself to write three chapters in a week if you've never done this before but if you notice how you work if you notice for a couple of weeks how much you're actually able to create within those 20 minutes or whatever you've planned for yourself then you'll have some a, a blueprint and then you can plan accordingly okay it's reasonable for me to write 3000 words in a week or in a day i don't know it depends on how much time you have you know but you start there you start with what you're actually able to create and then you create that plan, you know, with the bite-sized pieces and all of that. It, you get away from those huge tasks. And you also get away from the sort of generalized ideas of what is uh, reasonable, what is doable, like perfect. And for a lot of people, it's not doable. It's just, it's. You know, so it's about breaking things down into small pieces, but it's also understanding what those pieces needs to look like for you, given your particular circumstances in life and your ability and your experience and so on. So it's very much about taking a personalized approach to your work. And in your book, The Creative Doer, you talk about so many different examples of say, men who had the luxury of going off to the cabin in the woods and just creating and weren't taking care of their children or weren't having to do the caring of elders or all of those other things. So the thing of making it personalised makes so much sense if yeah. then you know how much energy you've got to be able to give. Exactly. And it's like, <laughs> it can be so crushing, you know, when you read that book about that person who sat down and wrote eight hours a day for three months and then the book was done. But And, and so you compare yourself with that and you feel like, I'm never going to be able to write the book. I could never do that and so on. Whereas what we should be asking is, is our life circumstances the same? Like, are, does he have something that I don't have? Or... Am I facing something that he doesn't have to face and so on? And then look at it from there. Because so often, as you say, those that we put on the pedestal, those that we try to model our own creative process on or our own work on, they have vastly different circumstances. Like that dude who goes off to the cabin to write. And the wife stays home and tends to the children. I mean, sure, that's one way to do it, but it's not available to a lot of us. <laughs> Definitely not for caretakers of, of any kind. So what I'm interested in, in looking at a more available way of doing our work, a more available way of being a creative, however, however we define that. Like if I have... 30 minutes a day what can I do with that how can I write that book given I only have 30 minutes a day and and to explore that process instead of comparing ourselves to that fellow who who has eight hours a day you don't have eight hours a day so it's, it's no point even comparing 
but rather look at, okay, what's available to me? And how can I make use of that? Like we can make a lot of things happen, really big things with very little time. If we know how to use that time, right? If we know how to work with ourselves and support ourselves in the process. So often we don't support ourselves. We're basically our own worst enemies. And it's like we think if we beat ourselves up, we're going to eventually get there. We're going to sit down. If only I can muster enough willpower. If only I had more character. or Whatever we call it, the grit, then I would be able to write that book. But what we miss is it's just, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe you will. But what would happen if you actually supported yourself instead? What would happen if you helped yourself succeed? If you did everything in your power to make this doable for yourself, what would happen then? What would the creative process look like then? What would it be like writing a book from that place rather than the one where you're sort of, like your inner critic is, is ruling uh, the whole process and, and it's all about beating yourself and bullying yourself to get in your chair and do the writing. I mean, you, you probably could write a book that way too. I think people do. But the process will be very different. And I think, and I speak from experience as an editor, I know that the result will be very different too because things doesn't really flow from that place. Uh, that, like, it, it will affect your writing. It will affect whatever you create from that place compared to you know, when you're supported, when you're relaxed, when you are your own best friend in this process, and when you have permission, when you have the space, that's when things flow. That's when interesting things start to happen. I was just going to ask about flow, actually, so I'm glad that you mentioned it, because sometimes it's talked about in quite a, almost an aspirational state of getting mm. to flow state and at times I've if I've gone back and re read something that I've written it's like I didn't almost notice when I slipped into that state so it doesn't always feel magical or you know all of those other things sometimes it's just a, a gear change to me um so I'd love to mm. hear more about what flow looks like for you I think I am interested in creating the circumstances where flow can happen, naturally happen. I don't like, and then it happens or it doesn't. And either way, I can still do my work. When it happens, it's really enjoyable. And some pretty amazing things can come through, you know, when you get into that fully focused. 100% present state that I think that flow is. But if it doesn't happen, I can still do the work. I can still show up for the work and do important things. Uh, so I don't pay too much, like, I don't want to pay too much attention to it because I think that attention, that, that focus sort of breeds tension. <laughs> And tension is, is the very opposite of flow. What I know by now, after doing this work and teaching these things for so long, is that there are certain circumstances, certain prerequisites, if you will, for flow to appear or flow to happen. And it has to do with relaxation. It has to do with inner and outer space. More the inner than the outer, but both helps. Uh, it has to do with what we started this conversation talking about, that overflow being filled up. That is definitely something that, that helps cultivate that state of mind, that, that flow is. It's not just a state of mind, actually, but it is that too. 
there's some something bigger to it. It's it's that feeling, you know, of when things doesn't just come from you, but they come through you as well. Something bigger comes through, and you're sort of in co-creation with that, whatever you want to call that bigger uh, force that comes through you. And for that to happen, I think we need to show up and to stay committed to this process. I think we need to be supported and supportive of ourselves and of our process, of our work. And um, you know, when we when we do that, when we create the space, it, it sometimes happens. And that's a beautiful thing, and it's it's a grace that is given to us. But I like to focus on the fact that when it doesn't happen, we can still do the work, because it easily becomes, you know, that thing when you sort of wait for inspiration before you can get to work. I don't want anyone waiting. I want us all doing. I want us all to get to work, to show up, and to create the best possible circumstances for ourselves. And when we do that, we increase the chances of, of getting into that flow state immensely. Uh, and then we can enjoy it when it comes. And when it leaves or when it doesn't come, we can still do the work and enjoy that. What do you think happens for people who maybe are hearing an inkling of what they're trying to create but then suppress it and don't let it come through or don't start to make space for it it's interesting how quickly we do that sometimes we get a sort of a hunch or an idea comes to us and we're so quickly to just figure out why we can't do that (laughs) or it's not a good idea or why it's not possible often it's fear speaking maybe that thing that idea feels out of reach given where we are right now maybe it's something that will ask you to change and you you're not comfortable changing or you're afraid of what would happen if you change but regardless of what it is this has to do with what we talked about before about the tiny steps Because when we get the idea, the first impulse, that is usually the end goal that we see. Maybe it's the finished book, or maybe it's the house that we want to build, or maybe it's, you know, that journey we want to take and we we dream of the goal. But the goal is not where we start working. Right? That's that's way over there. And we're here, and we need to figure out what the first step is on that journey towards that big goal. We need to hold that big goal lightly, if we can, very lightly, and then bring as much of our focus as we can back to right now, this present moment, the person I am right now, the circumstances I have to work with right now. What can I do? What's, what's the first step? And maybe the first step is, is something... A lot more doable. Maybe it's borrowing that book from the library to start doing some research about something. That we can do, right? That's not particularly scary. Maybe it's getting in touch with that person that you know who have done something similar and just get ask if, if they'd be up for a conversation about it. Get some ideas. So, you know, that kind of thing. That we can do that usually doesn't cause that kind of fear that leads us to shut down the idea. But when we think about getting from here to there, the big goal, that's scary. Because that's like a hundred steps from here. Or a thousand steps from here. It's one year, three years, five years down the line. And we're the person we are today aren't able to step right into that because a lot of change will happen along the, the journey from here to there. A lot of things will change, including you. A lot of growth will happen. 
a lot of unexpected things will happen. You will be given information along the, along the way that you don't have access to right now. You will run into the right people. You will be given support. You will learn things that you need to know. But it will happen gradually along the way. And the way to get there is to take the first step. The first small step. And then the second. So whatever that big dream is, I mean, enjoy it. It's, it's usually a beautiful vision when it comes to us that first, first time. But then, before fear starts shutting everything down, come back to this present moment and look, look for the first step. Because that's the most important one. It's so refreshing to hear because it's it's often that the big stories, like someone who quits their job and then, mm-hmm. you know, all of that stuff, it's like when you pull the rug out from underneath you. And yeah. in my nervous system, that just creates more fear because like you were talking about the basic needs then aren't being met. So mm-hmm. talking about change as sustainable steps is such a different way of thinking. Yeah. And it's when we hear those stories. And then she left her job and went into the mountains and built a house and, and, and whatever. We don't hear about those hundred steps that came before her quitting her job. The journey started way before that. But that's not, that's not, you know, as, as dramatic or interesting. I think it's super interesting, but that's not like the part of the story that we, we are told. But those steps are always there. And those are like, those are the stories that we, we'd actually need to hear. I'd like us to hear that. I always think about that now when I hear someone who has succeeded or gotten to where they wanted to go. And they're at that place and looking back. And when they tell their stories, I always sort of want to slow them down. <laughs> like, wait, 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 wait. That shift that you just mentioned in a sentence there. That probably took you two years or whatever. It, it took you so many decisions, so much in, inner work, so many conversations. Like I, I'd like to hear about that so that I understand that actually, no, it's not a sentence. It's not one step from here to there. It's, it's a hundred. It's all those small shifts and, and actions that creates that big change that is what we see in the end. But uh, like it, sometimes, yeah, sometimes there is one big dramatic leap. But first of all, that's the exception. That's my experience at least. It's the exception. And second, even in those cases, there is a process before that. If you were to talk about that person, like what came before? What were you processing inside? Maybe it wasn't visible on the outside. You couldn't see it in terms of actions or actual change. But what was going on inside that then manifested in this huge outside leap? That's the story. Right? That is where we can find the actual information on how to do these changes that we're looking for. I have a question about the, which I'm just trying to form in my head, about of the, the making it visible on the outside, because mm. a lot of people are carrying dreams that don't get to be fully realised. And do you think it's for everyone to live a life on their terms, or do you think there's a need for some people to kind of be the worker bees or the mm, I think this is a, a very important question in many ways because sometimes when we talk about these things going for your dreams and so on we sort of conveniently ignore the fact that we have such that our starting points are so different and sometimes it's a matter of privilege to be able to focus on these things like if if you're if you don't have food enough to sustain you then you're not going to be able to focus on your creative dream or whatever that's a given so i mean right there there is a difference 
it matters where you were born, what your socioeconomic status is, your level of education, your access to education. Uh, all those things will influence what choices are available to you and what you will be able to do with those choices. So that, that is real. Uh, and I never want to bypass that. The fact that it is that way. That is, I think, why I talk, why I focus so much on, on uh, your individual circumstances and creating a plan that is tailor-made for you. That actually, like that actually takes into account if you have only 15 minutes a day or if you have three hours a day or if you have all the time in the world, which is not very common, but <laughs> it does happen. So that, so that we can look at what is doable for you in your life right now. You probably, most people can't just quit their jobs, go for their dreams full time. And I'm not sure that's even a good idea, even if it was possible. But almost everyone, with the exception of, like I said, if you're starving or if you're, you know, in a, in a war zone or whatever, struggling for your life, that's that's the exception. But if you're not, if you if you have your very basic needs met, you can find some some little corner of your life that you can devote to what your dream is and how big that corner is how big that space is how much time you have that will affect the size and scope of the dream that you can go for and it will affect like the timeline whether you will be able to write that book in six months or six years but even if it takes six years, it's still worth doing. That's the thing. And like almost everyone can find 10 minutes in their day. And not find as in it's lying there, <laughs> not being used, but find as in sort of taking them back from something else that they've been spent on and, and devoting them to this one thing. That really matters to me. So it's not the same for everyone. It's we have vastly different starting points, and what we can achieve depends partly on that starting point. But I do think that almost everyone can find a way, can create a roadmap, personalized roadmap that will get you from where you are right now to somewhere that looks a lot more like your dream. I do believe that. And I also do believe that it doesn't always have to be the whole full makeover. I, I don't see that making a living from your dream is always the best, actually. I've seen that happen a lot of times where someone has a dream, they try to turn it into a business, and the dream sort of gets lost in that process because running a business is a whole like it's a whole different game. That's a project in and of itself. So sometimes the better option is to find a job that is good enough or, or that you can be satisfied with that pays your bills, keeps you fed and dry, and then create as much space as possible alongside that for this dream that you have. Sometimes that is a much better option, actually. And it might, you might not think so or see that right now, but along the line with a bit of trial and error, you might come to that conclusion. And that is just as valid Making money from your work, what I call your heart's work, isn't necessary. It isn't a qualifier. Like It's not real if you don't make money from it. That's bullshit. 
is real if it gives you joy, if it provides your life with meaning, if it helps you express yourself. It's real. It's valid. And you're a creator, regardless of, of whether you sort of are recognized as one or not. So there are so many layers to that question. You know, it's, it's, we have, we have, I think we're very much influenced by living in a capitalist society in that way, that we sort of only value what, what, uh, the kind of work that we do in exchange for money, the kind of work that is recognized by others and so on. And so part of this process in finding and cultivating your heart's work is beginning to validate yourself, validate your own work and validate your own life. This is how I want to want it to look. This is how I want it to feel. This is how I want to organize my life. And that might not look like, might not look fancy at all. It might not look like anything special, but it consists of those important parts that really matter to you. So, yeah. Plenty of things to say about that. but Just reflecting, as you were saying, that, that there's a lot within entrepreneurial communities where they're not looking sustainably and there's that kind of burnout is almost the badge of honour and also the size of the business as well. Like there's, there's someone who comes to mind who, who teaches entrepreneurial stuff who kind of says that, you know, if your business is not a seven-figure business, it doesn't count. And think, like, who is someone else yeah. to define your level of success? Your yeah. success is your success. So it's that capitalist, patriarchal way of thinking is, even in ways that are innovative, it can still seep through so yes. strongly. Totally. We still we still value size for for the sake of size or speed for the sake of speed and productivity just <laughs> for the sake of productivity almost it doesn't matter the quality of it just that we produce that's what matters and that's like that's totally at odds with sustainability where speed is nothing if the quality is not there if it doesn't feel like we want it to feel, uh, if we can't live our lives all the way while doing the work, right? That's, yeah. There is something about finding what is right for you. And that could be a seven-figure business, or it could be, you know, doing pottery at evenings after your work, after your paid job. Or it could be something in between where you're a one-woman show running your own business, but intentionally keeping it small because you appreciate the simplicity and flexibility of that. I mean, there it, it could look any way. That's the point. And you won't know what is your version of success until you've actually started doing it, start trying, seeing what it feels like. You might think that growing a big business is your version of a dream, and then you start doing it, and you notice that actually, no, that doesn't work alongside what you value in life. Or you start really small, and you notice that actually, I want to go really big here. You won't know until you try, and whatever you Whatever you find, <laughs> that's the right thing. That, I mean, that's, that's the whole story. Whatever you find, it's the right thing for you. I have such a burning question to finish about mm. education because I personally think that the education systems around the world don't really prepare young people for what the reality of the world around them is like. And with you doing the creative work that you do, do you have any perspective on, on that or whether you follow the educational system that's yeah. there, whether you do something different? Yeah, I have two, two daughters of my own who are both in school. 
so I, I do get to see it <laughs> close up <laughs> the way our children are being formed. And I'm in Sweden, and I know that school systems look differently all across the world, but I can only speak to this. And, and what I can see, though, in that what seems to be more or less universal is that the school system, the whole educational process is built on teaching children, students to provide the right answer. And the right answer is usually one answer. It's one thing that is right. And then the other things are wrong. And that the emphasis is more on the answer than the process of getting there. I see some changes in that. I see some changes towards more a more explorative approach to learning. But there's still, I mean, the whole grading system and, and the way you do the exams and you get a certain grade and so on, and depending on how many points you score. All of that is about providing the right answer. And what I know about the creative process and and the creative process is like I said before, it's about everything. It's about how you create a life as much as how you create art. It's about the way we work. And that process is about being wrong <laughs> most of the time. Daring to be wrong. Daring to go out on a limb, try something without knowing the outcome. It's about viewing failure as information rather than something to be avoided. If you avoid failure, if you try to avoid failure, you will miss out on a whole lot of information that would have helped you grow as a human, as a creative, as an entrepreneur, as whatever it is you're doing. And school effectively teaches us to avoid failure because failure means lower grades. So that is something that I'm... Oh, Wow, yeah. <laughs> oh, I would change that one if I could. I don't know how. <laughs> I honestly don't, because it's complex. <laughs> the, the whole school system would have to change in some fundamental way. But that is something that stumps us. It, it keeps us from growth, that fear of failure that is so hammered into us from an early age. That's something that I would be able, I would love to be able to just, you know, flip a switch and, and <laughs> we could sort of reset that mindset because that would help us instantly become much more creative, much less fearful in our work and in the way we move in the world. I can't though, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> But I can sort of take us on this more long-term journey of relearning these things. I'm glad I asked that question because that so relates, doesn't it, to just where that fear comes yes, in from the same Thank you so much for talking to me. There's just I'm such a yeah, I get so many gifts from being yeah. part of the community and really wanted my audience to get to hear about yeah, creativity. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you've enjoyed it, please send me a comment on Twitter or Instagram at Avni Touch. Subscribe to Speak From The Body on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Go to avni-touch.com forward slash podcast to get the show notes. And finally, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate and leave a review. It's very much appreciated. Thank you.